hypocrisy. That's always a good place to start. I am referring to my own, by the way. You'll have to hang in there for a moment to get there. But let's start here. I once lamented to a friend and fellow famous podcaster, (laughs) uh, Ben Courier, about someone who posts under a similar theme to my own, i.e. Zen, that this other person doesn't actually know doodly squat about Zen. He or she, I won't say who it is here, has in their bio that, that they teach others how to become a, quote, Zen badass. Never mind the paradoxical irony of such a statement. I mean, if you truly are studying and practicing Zen, you certainly aren't aiming to be a badass, since that's seemingly a kind of egotistical point of view, and in Zen, ego is the enemy. Don't worry, my own criticisms of my own perspective on this are forthcoming. But, I mean, why doesn't he or she just promote that they help people stay calm under pressure, if that's what the goal is? So I was complaining to my friend Ben, I mean, there's nothing Zen about what this person is doing. And I doubt they know the first thing about the history of Zen, or even the difference between the Rinzai and Soto schools of Zen. In the midst of my rant, Ben pointed out that I don't actually go into the academic side of Zen either, on my podcast or very rarely on social media. He was right. And I countered, well, I've got an audience that I'm speaking to, and my demographic is laypersons, not monks, regular folks, not stuffy academics. So in general, I avoid discussing the historical figures of Zen or about the sutras, which are essentially Buddhist scriptures. I avoid that stuff altogether because I try to convey modern Zen principles for regular people without a bunch of historical mumbo-jumbo or technical terms. I'm just trying to provide some perspective on life and how to live a happier, calmer existence. And then it dawned on me. Well, that's exactly what this other social media person is trying to do, too. Now, I might be right in my assessment that they are somewhat errantly calling themselves quote-unquote Zen without knowing the first thing about Zen or even Buddhism in general. They are likely using the term in the more colloquial sense that the word has adopted these days to simply mean being calm or minimalist. But here's the thing about my criticism. Yeah, um, my criticism? It is inherently hypocritical too. That is to say, my criticism is rooted in my own egoism, in my own egotistical, oh, I know more about Zen than she does or he does. Frankly, that's not very Zen of me at all to be that way. So, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone today. All those in and Buddhism traditionally aren't very keen on killing anything. I'm going to, just a little bit, just today, get a little more academic in my presentation of modern Western Zen to the masses. That's one bird. And in so doing, I'm going to also point out how you should question people like coaches who purport to be Zen badasses on social media, as well as question know-it-all folks and professors and podcasters like me. And that's the focus of the Zen sandwich. If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. More on that particular phrase in a moment. You're listening to Zen Sandwich, a podcast for the independent mind and anyone who embraces life despite its absurdities. Join former attorney and professor turned Japanese papermaker Mark Reed each week as he talks with creative, inspiring, and influential people, or as he shares his own research to help make your world a little better today than it was yesterday. Before I dive right in, a quick shout out is in order. Zen Sandwich has an official sponsor here and now in the present moment. Go to mandatetoelevate.com. That'll be in the show notes if you forget it. But take a look at all the great stuff Mariah and Byron Edgington are doing. I'll tell you what they're doing in a nutshell. They're making this world a better place. And that's why I'm more than happy to partner up with them. Because that's my mission too. They are the authors of the Amazon best-selling Journey Well books. 
I've read both of them. There's two of them, and there's a gratitude journal that goes along with them. They are TEDx speakers and keynote speakers. They have an amazing blog on neurodivergency. They really have a powerful message to share about raising people up and raising yourself up through affirmations. It's really good stuff. Go check out MandateToElevate.com. Get on their mailing list. And go get the first Journey Well book if you haven't already. No matter where you are in life, that book will elevate you to a whole new level, I assure you. Okay, on with what you should do when you meet the Buddha on the road. If you studied Buddhist philosophy a good bit, you will have or eventually will come across a famous saying, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. This enigmatic quote is originally attributed to Linji Yixuan. We'll just call him Lin Ji here on out. One of Zen tradition's most renowned masters. He's actually Chinese and a founder of a school of Chan Buddhism, which is a precursor to Zen, but I don't want to get too lost in the details here. This quote is akin to the struggles Christians often have reconciling Matthew 27, 46, in which Jesus cries out while on the cross, My God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, if you didn't know that was in the Bible, it is. Uh, go look it up, because you won't see it on a t-shirt or anywhere else. That's neither here nor there, and that verse has its own lengthy commentary and purpose and useful interpretations. And I'm not drawing an equivalent between that and the kill the Buddha saying, just merely pointing out that there is a hugely significant paradoxical statement in both traditions that can't simply be ignored. Okay, kill the Buddha is what we call in Zen jargon a koan, a term you'll often come across in the world of Zen. Koans are like little mental grenades that blow up your discriminating thoughts, leaving behind a landscape of deeper, more intuitive insight. That's the idea, anyway. The most famous koan of all, probably, is what's the sound of one hand clapping? Stuff like that. A bit nonsensical, but nonsensical on purpose. Generally, I don't get too bogged down in koans. That's more for the Rinzai folks that I alluded to before. I'm more rooted in the meditative tradition of Soto Zen. But that's the thing, and that's where I'm going. That's the thing I'm talking about. And it's very relevant to this conversation. I'm not trying to sell you on either school, nor should I. This is the killing Buddha part. Hang in there with me. You see, Zen isn't evangelical at all. There's no mission here to spread the good word of Soto or Rinzai or badassery for that matter. Zen just is. And if it speaks to you, great. If it doesn't, well, that just is too. Maybe Stoicism is your bag, baby. It ain't far off from what we got going on in the Zen world. But in the Western world, this particular koan has struck a chord since, well, forever, provoking a variety of interpretations. Some zany folks even took it quite literally, thinking Lin Chi was advocating actual violence. Spoiler alert, he wasn't. He wasn't encouraging violence or promoting the idea of physically eliminating the Buddha. That's just silly. His teachings were far more subtle, aimed at eliminating the mental constructs that separate us from the true essence of Buddhism. Or whether you should even care about that term Buddhism at all. More on that in a bit. In one modern interpretation, author and neuroscientist Sam Harris shed some light on the matter. He said, to turn the Buddha into a religious fetish is to miss the essence of what he taught. I would totally agree with that. So Sam encourages us to take Linji's admonishment seriously, but not literally, urging us to dispense with the trappings of dogma that often surround all religious figures and traditions and institutions. Linji didn't intend for us to take a sword to a Buddha statue, not at all. Slow your roll before you go hacking down statues at your nearby temple. Although it is an interesting side note, historically, Linji was actually a kind of fierce and uncompromising teacher, an iconoclast, known for using shouts and blows, yes, smacking students upside the head, not as punishment, but as a means to shock his students out of their wandering thoughts and into the pure clarity of the present moment. That's a pretty weird way to teach what we normally think of as Zen. He might have actually been a fan of Zen badassery for all I know. Anyway, I digress. Linji had a profound understanding of Buddha nature. And this is a core concept 
in Mahayana Buddhism. Now there I go again, getting all academic and jargony on you. Basically, Mahayana Buddhism begins in India, it becomes Chan Buddhism in China, and that later becomes Zen in Japan. I'll stop there on the historical lineage lesson, but Linji explained that Buddha means pureness of the mind whose radiance pervades the entire Dharma realm. That's what Buddha means. Not some god that sits up high in the sky in judgment. Fundamentalists of other religious traditions might try to convince you otherwise, but that just tells me they don't have a very good understanding of what Buddhism is about. Buddha is pureness of mind, which pervades the entire Dharma realm. And what is Dharma? It's not just some character played by Jenna Elfman on a 90s sitcom. Dharma can be translated to mean right direction, right duty, even truth or your true calling, the way, the Tao. It's hard to get a direct, exact translation on Dharma, but it basically means the path that you should take. In simpler terms, Linji is saying that the Buddha nature is the fundamental nature of all beings. So when Linji advises us to kill the Buddha, he's pointing to the illusion of seeing Buddha as something separate from ourselves. So when you think of the Buddha as something separate from you, that's the Buddha you should kill. Your Buddha nature isn't separate. It's within you. And if you follow traditional Christian thinking, which totally works in congruence with this thought here, this notion is found in God's omnipresence. Shunru Suzuki wrote in his book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, kill the Buddha if the Buddha exists somewhere else. Kill the Buddha because you should resume your own Buddha nature. Don't objectify anything. Not the Buddha, not even yourself. And by objectify, I mean hold it to some hard and unwavering ideal that is absolute. So to meet the Buddha on the road is to fall into a trap of dualism. That there is this us and some other thing outside of us. In reality, we are all just a part of this whole big thing. Life, the universe, all of it. You're just here and a part of the whole thing. You're not separate from it. So, this is easier said than done, but try to stop thinking about it as if there is this you apart from everything else. Now, some interpretations take killing the Buddha to mean rejecting all religious doctrine. While that's not entirely wrong, it still falls a little short of Linji's teaching, too. Linji wanted us to transcend a more conceptual understanding and dive into the depths of direct realization. True knowledge through observation and experience. In the world of Zen, that means, get ready for it, if you can grasp it intellectually, well, that means you're not quite there yet. <laughs> you don't get it. Put yet another way, it's not something to figure out through some religious or mathematical formula. So, you know, stop thinking so much. You're getting in your own way. In the end, killing the Buddha is a call to break free from the shackles of duality. Let go of rigid concepts. Embrace the boundless wisdom that already resides within you. It's not about violence or even rejection, really. It's about realizing the Buddha nature. And you don't have to even call it that if you're not comfortable with that. You don't have to care about Buddha or Buddhism whatsoever. Once again, I'm not here to sell you a label, a name, a little statue, a membership into a club or a t-shirt. Whatever you name it doesn't matter. It just is. I should sell Sin's Image t-shirts, by the way. Anyway, but I'm talking about the essence that flows through every fiber of your being. Get in tune with that, your intuition, being mindful, being awake to the present moment, that stuff. So, the next time you encounter the Buddha, remember what Linji said, kill him, and killing the Buddha means Killing your conceptualizations. Here it is. It means killing the belief that we understand it all, that we understand everything. No one does. No preacher, 
No monk. Not even Kane, a.k.a. Grasshopper from the TV show Kung Fu. No Zen badass on LinkedIn. And certainly no podcaster. Don't kill Buddha with a sword, but with intuitive wisdom that lies beyond words and thoughts. Don't try to understand everything. Just be, man or woman. Do that. Do that, and you just might become a Zen badass after all. That's all, folks. Zen Sandwich is looking for sponsors like Mandate to Elevate that I mentioned earlier. Don't forget to go check them out. And if you, too, would like to become a sponsor, go to patreon.com slash Zen Sandwich to find out how you can sponsor the show. Or if you have questions, just email the show at zensandwich at gmail.com. Thanks for being here and being present with me. Most of all, breathe. Don't forget to breathe.